All right, let's move. We got lots and lots of Lord's Supper to cover today in Peeper. So let's go go on. What's that? Both kinds. Both kinds. Oh, yeah. All right. A quick, any quick questions then as we launch into this? Alex. Uh, and maybe we'll get to it later, but um, bottom of 330, um, I was scratching my head about. Um, you have, he's talking about Matthew 26, obviously, but then he kind of jumps over to, to John 6. Uh-huh. And then, so Luther is very much against John 6 being about the This sacrament, so, right. Yeah. So I don't know if... Yeah. I need a little more. Okay, let's go ahead and hit this one right now that I can be done with this. Um, John 6 is always kind of this notorious thing. And Luther said, John 6 should not be applied to the Lord's Supper. So therefore, every Lutheran is terrified of doing it. Because Luther said you shouldn't. But here's the reality. How many of you have ever read John 6 and not thought of the Lord's Supper? And he's so emphatic about it. Yeah. And so, and here, and here, well, here's why. And here's the reason why. John 6, in my opinion, is clearly Eucharistic. It just clearly is. And this is, in my, in my case, I think is made even stronger. By John 6, of course, you all know, you know, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink as well, you have no life in you. Does that sound Eucharistic to anybody? <laughs> all right? And so, now, and the reason I think it's slam dunk that it's Eucharistic for John is, where is the Lord's Supper in John's Gospel? It's not there. And see, this becomes glaringly apparent on Monday, Thursday, when if you're doing the synoptics, you get Monday, Thursday is about the Lord's Supper. If you're doing John, Monday, Thursday is about washing feet. And so which text are you going to follow? If you're a John guy, you're all washing feet and all kinds of stuff, whatever the Lord's Supper. If you're synoptics, it's all about the Lord's Supper. There isn't no washing feet. And so John doesn't have it. Now, would John leave the Lord's Supper out of his gospel? No, he just conceals it in John 6, which makes complete sense historically, for John writing in 100 A.D. instead of writing in 60 A.D. Because now, Rome has gotten a little more, you know, against them. It's a little more scary. It's a little more sketchy. And so you want to be a little bit more cautious. So I think John's just kind of concealing it. Now, so I would say, yes, John 6 has Eucharistic overtones all over the place, and this is John's Lord's Supper. However, because it's veiled and concealed and somewhat underneath, should you build Eucharistic doctrine out of John 6? No, never. And that's Luther's point. And the reason he's concerned about it is because Rome is doing that. They take John 6 and all this classic assume, well, clearly this is Lord's Supper, so they start building all this detailed theology out of John 6, where Luther would say, you don't build theology out of things that are unclear. Take it where it's clear, like the synoptics or Paul in 1 Corinthians. Don't use John 6 to establish Lord's Supper theology. I agree completely with that. So when you read John 6, do you see it being Eucharistic? Can you preach it that way? Sure. But should you build doctrine out of it? No. And I would do the same thing with parables. I don't, you would never build doctrine out of parables. Like, well, Lazarus talks to Abraham, therefore, obviously, the people who are dead can have those kinds of conversations. It's a parable. What are you doing? You know, you're, you're, you're acting like this is a reflection of reality. It's a parable. And we don't, don't inflate so much out of it. Let it be the parable, which is teaching a, one meaning. And to try to say, well, the parable says this, therefore all these things. No, you just got to back it off of that. You build your doctrine out of things that are clear cut. Obviously, this is truth being declared. And a parable has got truth, but it's not all the details. You see what I mean? You tracking with me on this one? All right. So that's, good. that's a fair question. And I wouldn't have hit that, so I'm glad you brought it up. All right. Let's crank through pages. Um, obviously, the very front part of this is a detailed, excruciatingly detailed, you read it, excruciatingly detailed unpacking of what's wrong with it, just the symbol. And Peeper leaves no stone unturned. Now, uh, why is Peeper so carefully detailed here? Brian. Isn't uh, stuff happening over in Germany and, and like, even here in America about people just rejecting? Yeah. I mean, this is, the, this is the big issue. And this is where the Lutherans just kind of stand alone on the Lord's Supper. And so Peeper has to come hard against this because there's so much conflict around this. And that's the big issue. So we, I'm, frankly, today, I'm not going to try to retrace all of Peeper's argument. I can't do it much better than he does it. You know, what does is mean? Anybody? It is. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, you kind of get that if you're done with Peeper. Yeah. How many pages do you take to tell us this? But he has to do this because there's so many people arguing with it. Now, what I want to start with today, before we get back to Peeper and cranking pages then, is I want to kind of just recap how this often gets set up. So we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper today. And here's, here we are. Now you're in eighth grade. Put yourself back in catechism class. And here is your pastor. That will be me today. And I'm saying, now, 
confirmands, preparing to learn about the Lord's Supper, here's what you need to know about communion. So, there are Roman Catholics, and what Roman Catholics believe is that the bread and the wine are changed, and you get body, and you get blood. But that's all you get because they have this thing called transubstantiation. And because of transubstantiation, they would say that what's happening is the bread and wine are gone, and only the body and blood are there. And that's what Catholics teach. On the other hand, you have the Reformed. And the Reformed, in case you don't know, are all the people who are Protestants that aren't Lutheran. All right? And so, Baptists and Pentecostals and Presbyterians, they're all Reformed when it comes to this. And what they would say is that the bread is exactly that, bread. And that the wine is exactly that, wine. Oh, I'm sorry, grape juice. Because wine's evil, because it's got alcohol in it. And so Jesus didn't drink wine, he just drank grape juice because he would never be impious and drink wine. Um, and even if he did, you can't because Jesus is Jesus. So anyway, sorry for the facetious aside, but I can't resist. All right, so it's only bread and wine. And is there body and blood here? No. This is, my friends, only a symbol. It's only a symbol. And now, here's the beautiful thing. Roman Catholics, you only get body and blood. Reformed, you only get bread and wine. We're Lutheran. And we have it right. And what we understand is you get all four. And that's the difference between us and everybody else. Yeah, you love being Lutheran. Now, how many have heard something like this? Yeah, we've all been there. And most people hear this and they go away saying, oh, okay. So Lutheran's kind of cool. We get all four. But then the takeaway is, so what's wrong with the reform position? Well, they're only getting a symbol. And what's wrong with Rome? Well, they're only getting body and blood, and they don't think it's bread and wine. But what's the big deal? And what's the big deal? And my concern with this is, when it gets taught like this, and my experience is, this is usually how it gets taught, and usually left about here. And, okay, next topic, let's talk about baptism, or off we go. You know, everything's, everything needs to be said has been said. No, nothing that matters has been said yet. See, the real point is, what's going on underneath all this stuff? What's the real problem with the Roman Catholic position? Is it transubstantiation? No. Transubstantiation is not a big deal. What does this mean anyway? It's just, we're just playing a little Aristotelian philosophy here. You all know this, right? So you've got substance and accidents. So you've got bread, who has got accidents of white color, certain texture, certain smell, but it's got bread substance. And But when the pastor says the words, or the priest says, hoc es corpus meum, well, at that moment, the substance, the guts of it that makes it bread, has disappeared, and Christ's body substance has come in. But the accidents, they're still the same. So it still looks and smells and tastes like bread, but it's really the body. Now, from a philosophical standpoint, this explanation is nothing short of brilliant. It really is. It's genius. Like, well, that is so cool. It looks like bread to me, but it's only accidents of bread. The substance is the substance of Jesus. Brilliant! you got to love it. It just glows. It's, it's, it's wonderful. All right? And so the same thing with the blood. Looks like blood. Or looks like, looks like plain old wine, but it's actually the blood because the substance has changed. Now, the problem, though, is not that. Because it's not that big a deal that, well, it's not really bread anymore. It doesn't really matter that much. That's just the minutia of the problem. So this is not the issue. The problem with transubstantiation is not even that it's wrong. The problem with transubstantiation is it's going too far. We don't know. We don't know how Christ is present. It could be this, but we don't know. And when you start asserting this, you're going too far. You're stretching too far. This is also why Luther rejected consubstantiation. And people out there, especially Calvinists and Reformed, say, Roman Catholics are transubstantiation, Lutherans are consubstantiation. They love to do this. And our response is, no, we're not. We don't believe that either because we don't try to explain anything. We're not in the explanation business. Don't care. So, is Christ present? Yes. With his body and blood? Of course. How? Don't know. Don't care. He promised it. Done. And the, kick, the kicker for a Lutheran always, always, always is promise, promise, promise. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter that it makes sense. Jesus said so. And because Jesus promised it, done. End of story. So why do you know Jesus is in the Lord's Supper? He said so. 
How is he there? I don't know. Can't even begin to explain it. So is he in the bread, in with and under? Yep. Whatever that means, I don't know. But he's there. Now, the problem here then is what? What's the big problem over here? Tim. Yeah. Well, it's going to get into incarnational problems. You're going to get into incarnational problems. That's part of it. There's a much bigger Lord's Supper issue, though. Because you're right about that. But what's the, most, what's the biggest problem over here? It's the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, what does that mean? What they mean by the sacrifice of the Mass is that when the priest says the words of institution, hoc est corpus melum, he is actually re-sacrificing Christ right there on the altar. And now we have Christ's body being presented on this altar, an unbloody sacrifice, and yet he's being offered. And by my very faithful action of saying, hoc est corpus melum, I am bringing forgiveness to the people who are present in this place, winning new forgiveness. Whoa. So what gets undercut is this full atonement of Christ on the cross. It's like it's not quite enough. We're going to add to it. And in fact, I'm adding to it by my faithful action. And now, once we make this move, the floodgates open for all kinds of craziness. So if I'm there, and I'm watching the priest say the words, and I'm being participating, and then I go up and I get the host, I've just gotten some of the grace of the day. I've participated. But maybe I don't have to be present. Maybe the priest can say the sacrament and do it, and he can send all that grace to a certain place somewhere else. And maybe he can say a mass for the dead. And so now you can have a priest standing in an empty sanctuary at the altar, going through the liturgy for the Lord's Supper, and saying everything, taking the sacrament himself, and then saying the Amen, and all that grace is deposited in Aunt Frida's purgatory account. And now, ka-ching, we just knocked off a thousand years by his faithful work. And then he's going to do it again. Ka-ching, two thousand years. He's going to do it again. Ka-ching, three thousand years. Now, is the priest going to do it for a freebie? Probably not. So you might encourage him to do this for Aunt Frida by a faithful gift to the congregation, etc. And now, talk about the floodgates of abuse. Whew. So the big problem here is this idea of the sacrifice of the Mass. And it's not even the abuse that's the issue. The issue is the notion that somehow we are earning more forgiveness. We are participating in this sacrifice anew right here. And Christ is being re-offered right now at this time. And this action of ours is gaining grace and forgiveness. That's the problem. This is the Roman Catholic problem. And when you get that, you say, well, that's kind of significant. That's kind of serious. And it is. All right. Now, way over here. What's the real? Oh, go ahead. Well, the sacrifice of mass is the sacrifice of the mass for the dead. Is that still a current Catholic yes. practice? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> um, if Rome has ever done it, they still do it. Because Rome never repents of anything. Because to say you were wrong means if <laughs> you were wrong. And the church is never wrong. So once you've said something, you just got to keep going. They might lessen it or mitigate it or soften it, but you can't take it away. And does this stuff still go on? Yeah. You can just talk to your parishioners, find out on vicarage, talk, talk to former Catholics, ask them about when their rel relatives die and how the priest comes and says, well, you know, we can offer you this or this. It still happens. And, yeah, and people are sometimes shocked to know it, but it, you know, it still goes on. Yep. Right. Uh, for my birthday, my grandmother's Catholic would send me cards that say, I'm going to get mass for me. Yeah, there you go. A birthday mass for you. Like how cool, Brian. Right? Yeah, oh, thanks, Grandma. <laughs> How much, how, much, how much indulgence do I get for this? That's what you should find out. Coleman? Oh, I, this happened at my grandfather's funeral. My question is more on um, the lines of, is it the context that determines the meaning for this? In other words, this is my body. Mm -hmm. We understand that as real presence, whereas they're saying, no, this is a sacrifice we're doing before God. But they're saying it is the, really the body. So in other words, are they actually having the sacrament there? I would say yes, because they're not, they're not changing the meaning of the words. They're not saying this isn't really Christ's body. They're saying this is exactly what it is. Yeah, but they're saying, wait, but but they're saying it does something. The impact is different. This is, and the, the key is that the priest is actually winning for giving forgiveness. That's the thing, because he's got the magic hands, and he makes the forgiveness happen there on the altar. He's almost like conjuring the forgiveness. And that's strong words, but I'm using them intentionally. All right, Brian. So... We would say that Rome is receiving the sacrament uh, mm -hmm. incorrectly, but a reformed I'll, I'll get there in a minute. That's right. And so, and by the way, 
you heard you hear the words of the go ahead Josh okay um, I guess I'm getting really confused and I guess I'm slightly sympathetic because we talk a lot about how we do gain forgiveness in right whose forgiveness uh, is it it's Christ's forgiveness where was it one and on the cross thank you okay so that's the <laughs> difference that is they because uh, they talk about how you continuously need more grace and we do talk about how we continually but how much grace does God give you each time you ask all of, all of it right okay not little bits and pieces okay right Yes. I mean, it's a little bit off, off top a little bit, but when I was Catholic, um, they built a new church, and just showing how they get things off center, wrong focus, they built this beautiful new church, and then they put the altar in the middle, and then they put the um, crucifix off center. Oh, yeah? Because it distracted, apparently, from whatever was supposed to go on at the altar. Huh. Um, so That's unfortunate. That was, that was what I was told. Well, maybe it's just meant for aesthetic taste. Because they're not, they don't like the symmetry, maybe. Thank you. All right. Now, one other thing here, just a note in passing. So the Latin Mass, you got hocus corpus mellum. This is where the magic words came from. Hocus pocus. Some hocus corpus mellum. Yeah. So hocus pocus presto changeo. Because in the Middle Ages, the people just saw the priest up there doing magic and saying hocus corpus mellums, hocus corpus. So hocus pocus came from the Latin Mass. That's where it comes from. Isn't that cool? All right. That's your little trivia for the day. Now, over to the Reformed. What's the big issue over here? They're they don't even have a sacrament because they're saying this isn't bread and this is just bread and wine. And when we say this is my body, well, it's, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, not really. And then you have hold the debate. Is it this is where the problem is? And that's what Karlstadt says. This is my body, <clears throat> not the bread. That's kind of dumb. Or you can have Zwingli. This is my body. And the problem is is, is means symbol. Or you can have Calvin. This is my body. Well, what body are we talking about? And so you're, you're, you're playing with the words. You only have three words to play with, or four. And so you've got to figure out which one where the magic is happening. But they're all alike in reducing the actual real presence. Now, that's true. So now, if the problem is, if the word body doesn't really mean Christ's body, you're not really talking about a Lord's Supper. And this is kind of back to the peeper problem of the semiotics involved, or the conceptual signifieds. So they're saying the word body, but they don't mean Christ's body. They mean spiritual presence, and that's sh sh emptying the, the reality of it, so we don't have it. So that's a problem. There's a deeper issue here as well, though, because in the Roman Catholic, I mean, in the Reformed understanding of the sacrament, how does Christ come to you? He comes to you when you believe. He comes to you if you believe and make it happen. So this becomes an action of the law and not gospel. I'm doing this out of obedience, and if I have the right attitude, the right faith, the right sincerity, then I can get a benefit from it, but I've got to perform. And so this becomes a law-based action, and the whole point of the sacrament is it's gospel. They don't have any gospel going over here. It's not. They can talk about you meet Jesus at the altar, but only if you feel the right way about it, only if you've got the right faith, only if you've got the right attitude. If you just wander up there, are you going to get Jesus? No. No. So then, the question is always, did I really mean it? Did I meet Jesus or not? I don't know. I don't feel it today. Guess not. And the beauty for you is, it doesn't matter what your spiritual mind is when you're wandering up there. You could be obsessed with some issue you're dealing with in life, and you just kind of wander to the front of the chapel and get the sacrament, go to the sacrament, sit down and say, oh, wait a minute. I just got Jesus. That's pretty cool. And you don't have to say, oh, no, I got it wrong. I better go again and try a second time. Because he was there for you, whether you thought he was or not. And that's the power for us. That's the cool thing. See, the problem then this is you're, you're shooting the gospel out of it. There's no gospel left. And that's the problem over here, too. It's really not gospel. It's performance. And the biggest difference in between the Lutheran understanding and these other understandings is these end up being all about the law. This is delivering the gospel. And that's what we bring. So it's not a matter of how many elements do you get. They only get two. They only get two. We get all four. Spare me. That's so superficial. The real point is they make it into law. They make it into law. We're delivering gospel. That's, that's the real difference in our different understandings. Okay, everybody with me here? All right, good. So now that's my kind of overview introduction. And what I'm encouraging you to do is never be content to teach this as two, two, four. Okay, any questions? Now let's go on. Because your people will be left thinking, what's the big deal? And then is it any surprise that people will go to the Lord's Supper at a Presbyterian church because, so what? Or they'll be at a Catholic Mass and they'll take the sacrament. So what? Because they don't get it. They don't see the bigger picture of what's going on here. 
All right, <clears throat> good. So off we go. And we're just going to move forward quickly now because we have short time. So there's not much more to say. We would say there's a sacramental union, and this is not a um, capernatic eating. And this gets dicey, frankly, because, you see, people would like to accuse Lutherans of saying, well, you're like cannibals because you're eating Jesus, and you're chewing on his his muscles and stuff. And we would say, well, no, that's kind of not the point. And this gets into the whole thing we talked about last quarter of how is Christ present? Locally, spiritually, mystically, corporally, you know, all the different ways he can be present. And one of the ways he's present that the church fathers have talked about is a sacramental presence. And that's the terminology we would say, that Christ is present in a sacramental way according to his promise. So he is present where he is, and according to his promise, he is present sacramentally with his true body and blood. We don't understand how, but he's there. But if you actually do an analysis of the little bit of bread in your guts, is it going to test out like human body? No. But is he there? Yes. And that's what we confess. All right. So I think we're fine with that. Um, the other thing is to remember also, and this is pointed out very well, that um, many blessings, Christopher. All right. Um, the thing is stressed here very heavily, I think it's just quite, quite nicely, that Pieper gets that again. We talked about this last quarter, at least in, um, in, when we did Christology in my section, is that the Reformed get into trouble. Because if they're going to say, it doesn't make any sense that Christ can be here, well, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. All right? Like, how can God be in a human body? That doesn't make much sense either. And so, what is quite rightly said is, the whole premise over here is finitum non capax infinity. And you should know this Latin phrase. Okay? Finitum non capax infinity, which simply means the finite is not capable of the infinite. You can't take something infinite and shove it into something finite, which makes good sense. You can't take an infinite amount of water and put it into a Dixie cup. Okay? So you can't take the infinite Godhead and shove it into a piece of bread. Jesus is infinite. How can he be in this piece of bread? That doesn't make any sense. True. You're right. Okay, you win. But, so we'll, we'll deny the Lord's Supper is Christ's presence. But now what about the incarnation? He, how's he in a body? I don't know. But that one's okay, but this one's not. Come on, guys. And see, this is, this is the real, to me, I don't know how the Reformed ever get past this. They just, how do you get past this? Because if you're going to claim the finitum not capax infinity and say, it doesn't make any sense, so we have to deny it, then you have to throw out the incarnation. And let's be quite honest here. There is only one reason not to take Jesus' words at face value. Pieper makes this so clear. This is my body. What is he saying? He's saying, this is my body. How should you hear that? <laughs> he said it. Is there, this only reason to take it as, well, it's got to be a symbol, is because it doesn't make any sense. How could it possibly be that way? But if you're going to yield that God can do what he wants, and if he wants to give us himself through this sacrament, he can certainly do that, just like God can become incarnate in the human body. Who are we to tell God what to do? And that, to me, is exactly the rub of this whole thing. And if you press your Reformed evangelical friends on this, this is where they're always going to start to limp along. Why deny it? Why not take it at face value? This is what Luther stresses. Come on, this is a sober moment. This is Jesus' last will and testament. People don't lie or make up rules or play symbols when it comes to your last will and testament. They become utterly serious. Brian. Couldn't you say this? I mean, couldn't the reform that when they would ever do this, but say the same thing about Jesus' death on the cross? No, that's what? And is it, uh, couldn't they say the same thing about Jesus' death on the cross? In what way? That, uh, uh, we, you, you have to take Jesus' words at face value or, or just say it's not possible. And so what's your... Like, I mean, wouldn't, uh, couldn't you kind of say that, well, the same reasoning applies to Jesus' death on the cross? I think so. I'm not sure if I'm tracking what Like, uh, <clears throat> um, so... The, the only way that it doesn't, the only way that it makes sense is to just kind of take it at face value. Take it at face value. And not stop because, reading I mean, into we, it. And couldn't we say the same thing about? Yes. Like, yeah. Right? Yes. So the 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 Christ, his death is the same way. You got to just be take a good, uh, correlation. You can do that. Okay. Yes, that would be good. Just. Um, so the Finitum non complex infinity. Did he come with that statement and start teaching that in relation to communion? 
because every time I've heard it before this point, it's always in relation to human understanding and philosophy yeah. and the human the limits. Yeah, of reason. I have not dug into the history of it enough, but I'm 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 guessing this is kind of I think Zwingli was the one who started this, and Zwingli probably would have been educated, and he was a humanist, so he would have known that phrase, and now he's going to take it and apply it to this because Zwingli was the first one, frankly, who went way beyond and just started chucking the whole thing. Zwingli and Karl Stadt were in kind of cahoots on this of hey, Rome's bad, let's take them the whole way, and so I think that's probably what he had done is taken something he had learned in his scholastic upbringing and just started applying it conveniently here. I think that I would have to track that down. I haven't done that. Coleman. Similar question. Were there any other uh, controversies or, uh, or teachings reject? I mean, I think the oh, oh, surrounding the Lord's Supper prior to that. Not really. I mean, you you have concerns about the abuses. I mean, already you're getting people who are saying, hey, you know, buying a song of sacraments not too good. You know, kind of having a free pass to do all kinds of sin. That's not so cool. You've got plenty of people already mocking. The, the abuses. Um, you've got Erasmus, you know, divine folly, all kinds of stuff. People are, are already seeing the problems. I mean, I'm talking uh, all of church history. Right? Yeah, I, it, it, these things are gradual, and you're asking the wrong guy. I'm not, I'm not a medieval historian. Go ask Robinson or somebody, and he might be able to give you a better answer, but I don't know that answer, frankly. But you, there were certainly people already concerned about this, because the abuses are just rampant. And now this does, I can't speak to this next thing, I'll say. Here's part of the issue then. So, so you see Rome doing all this stuff, and the church is just so messed up, and you say, what's the common thing in all this? Well, it's the Lord's Supper is all goofed up. So the, the, the answer then is, well, let's just say it's really not the body and blood of Christ. Won't that solve a lot of our problems? If it just becomes a symbol, you can't buy and sell anymore. There's nothing to buy and sell. And so, in a sense, what's driving Zwingli is a desire to clean it all up. So the best way to clean it all up is just throw out everything. And this, is, this starts to illustrate then the big difference between Luther and the other reformers. Because Zwingli and Calvin want to do whatever it takes just to shut up Rome. And Luther was much more interested in saying, what's the truth here? And the truth is, this is my body. I have to confess it. And Luther even says, it's at some point, he says, you know, it would have been really cool to go the whole way and really give the Pope a good trouncing. And if I would have jumped on Zwingli's bandwagon, we could have really let the Pope have it. But he wouldn't do it. So he's not motivated just by letting the Pope have it. He's motivated by what's the truth here. And he admits it would have been even better if we could have all been unified as Protestants, all agree it's just a symbol, then we could have really gone after the Pope and really, really trounced him. But he wouldn't because... That's not what it says. And, the, and you see, this is why the Marburg Colloquy in 1530 is so significant. So, or I think it's 30. So they all get together in, in the spring, and they're going to have this big meeting with Zwingli and Luther, and they're going to try to finally get unity. And they've got these 19 points, and they agree on all of them except for Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. And there's pressure like crazy to get unity. And Zwingli starts giving like all kinds of ground and yielding surprisingly on all kinds of stuff. And it seems like Luther should be able to give just a little bit, but he won't. He's just stubborn as heck on this. And the story even goes, he gets into there the night before, writes on the table, Hoke est corpus, is. And he covers it up with a tablecloth, and that's the height of the debate, and Luther whips off the tablecloth, est, and walks out of the room. You know, awesome. You know, it's Luther being Luther. And, but the point is, he's not going to give just because it would work. He's not pragmatically driven. He's driven by truth. And there's lessons there for us, guys. There's lessons there for us. There are so many things in your ministry that you can make life so much easier if you would just cut some slack, just back off. But you've got to go with what's the truth here, what's real. All right, good? All right, moving onward then. So we got all this great stuff. Krauss, Calvin, um, brought up Walters in here, all kinds of good stuff. And then page 317, I'm moving right along, about six lines down the page. Every word must be taken in its first, that is, proper, its proper meaning, until circumstances contained in the context or an express declaration of the writer compel one to substitute the figurative symbolic meaning for the natural. That's the basic hermeneutical rule at work here. So when Jesus says, this is my body, how do you take it? This is my body. Unless there's a reason to take it otherwise. So when Jesus says, I am the door, probably we should say, what might that mean? And as Peter stresses, is he a door? Yeah. Just not the kind of door we thought he was. But he is certainly a door. Is is not a problem here. Is means is. The metaphor is in door. And so when Jesus says, this is my body, how should we take it? Wow. It's his body. He doesn't say anything about symbol. Why would it be a symbol? This is his body. That's pretty profound. Cool. So now we have ourselves a sacrament. All right. 
That's good. Um, Finitum non compact infinity shows up on 323 with the S tossed in, which is fine. And this becomes the, cons the real thing all the way through. And, and Pieper says this too on page 324. Last sentence of the first full paragraph, or the first incomplete paragraph. In other words, all arguments that reformed against the true presence of Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper finally simmer down to this one fundamental principle that only a local and visible presence is possible for Christ according to his human nature. So what they were saying is, and this gets back to Christology, human nature is by definition limited. So human nature has to be one place at one time. And where is Christ's body today? Parked on a throne in heaven. See, down here in this sacrament, can't be, because human bodies can't do that, therefore he can't be there. And what are they doing? They're applying the rules of human logic and human definition to their sacramental theology. So, sacramental theology and Christology go hand in hand. So last quarter when I had you guys plow through Chemnitz's Two Natures of Christ, and some of you, you know, maybe you not all did that, but what's Chemnitz up to? 500 pages the, on Christ's Two Natures. Why is Chemnitz so worked up about this? Because of this. Because in the, in the middle, in the late 16th century, this is the raging thing. And so Chemnitz wants to get his Christology pinned down, because if I get our Christology right, then our sacramental theology will also be right. Get your Christology wrong, sacraments all fall apart. All right, good, 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 good. And now we're just cruising along here. All right. Any questions anywhere? All, oh, and here's Luther's temptation. I'm on page 343. Top of the page. Luther, too, confesses that his flesh tempted him to put a different meaning into the words of institution than they contained because he saw well that thus he could have given the Pope of papacy a good trouncing. But he adds, I am held captive, cannot escape. The text stands there, too powerful, and words cannot uproot it from my mind. And so this is, this is Luther. So in other words, it, it would be so cool to get on Zwingli's bandwagon and just say it's a symbol. It would solve so many problems. But you just you can't. Because the words are the words. And that's exactly where our Lutheran position stands to this day. All right. <clears throat> Good. And, oh, another phrase you should know from Latin, page 349. You'll run across this from time to time. This is about five lines down, six lines down in the new section five. You have this Latin phrase, ipsima verba. Let me get, get my spelling right because I always spell this wrong. Okay, Ips, ipsisma, ipsisma verba, which means what? The very words themselves. And so this is the shorthand Latin for the words of institution. So, this, and this is recorded in 1 Corinthians for us. This is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take, eat, or take, drink, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Those are the ipsisma verba. And often you'll just hear it shortened down to the verba, which means the words. And what we're talking about is the words of institution or the words of consecration. And you'll see, and you'll, you'll hear sometimes, sometimes short, shorthand, theologians will say the, the ipsisma. And what they're talking about is the words of institution, Christ's actual words, the very words themselves. Okay? Good. So I, I want you to know that so that you can talk with people about these things. All right. Good. So now we're going to cruise forward. And I'll, there's these pages intervening, which I didn't make you read, but I'm going to call attention to a few things from 349 up to where we jump in again, about three, wherever it is, 70-something. And there's a few things I want you to catch along the way here. Um, we'll talk more about this next time after you read about the whole consecrationism versus receptionism. But it's critical to remember that the Lord's Supper is given for people to eat and to drink. That's why we don't start playing games over here where when the priest says, hocus corpus metum, boom, this is now the body. And now if we have Christ present, hey, let's use Christ as our little magic look charm. And people, this would happen. So in the Middle Ages, if you had a city being threatened with the flood, what would you do? You would have a Corpus Christi processional. And what does Corpus Christi literally mean? The body of Christ. And so you would say the words of institution, but nobody would eat. Instead, you would take the host, put it up on your monstrance or on your processional cross with the host in the middle, and now who's on the cross? Jesus. And now, is Satan going to come anywhere near you? You got Jesus there, okay? And is any flood going to come to your city? Not with Jesus there. And so then you take Jesus and you parade him around town and you keep everybody safe. This is how it would happen. 
And this, this kind of superstition still continues in a lot of places over this kind of Corpus Christi stuff. And this becomes part of the abuses. Or you get the other abuses that people would sometimes in the Middle Ages, you know, they would receive the host and they would take it home, which is why you started having the practice of putting it right in your mouth. Because people were taking the host home and got Jesus in my pocket. You know, I'm safe from everything. No vampire is going to get me because I got Jesus in my pocket. And all kinds of silliness would start growing out of this. So that's one of the problems we're kind of trying to push back against. So there needs to be eating and drinking. That's the point of the sacrament, not presto change, we got Jesus in our back pocket now. All right, <laughs> what about grape juice? Let's talk about that real quick. Can we substitute elements? No. no. So back to baptism. But this one's even more clear cut. Because with the baptism, you can argue emergency. There is never any such thing as an emergency Lord's Supper. It does not exist. Nobody has to have the Lord's Supper or they're going to go to hell. Okay? So there's never a compelling reason to make up the Lord's Supper. And you hear stories. We were having a jailhouse visit, and we couldn't have any alcohol. And so we got a Coke and some peanuts out of the vending machine, and we had the Lord's Supper with Coke and peanuts. Oh, it's so special. It's stupid. Stupid. It's wrong. Okay? You don't do that. You don't substitute the elements. It's bread and wine. And wine should be bread, fruit of the vine. It's what it says. And so can you substitute apple wine or cranberry wine? No. No. It's wine. Yeah, watermelon wine. I ran into this problem when I was in the Philippines once with a group from my church, and um, I wanted to have the Lord's Supper on the last night. And I forgot to get wine. In, Philipp in, the, wine, in the Philippines, it's hard to find wine. Beer, no problem. Um, liquor, no problem. Wine is tough. I could find wine coolers, but they weren't made with real wine. They were actually made with apple wine or something, fermented out in apple juice. And so we didn't have the sacrament, which is a bummer, because I just couldn't, couldn't get any grape wine when I needed it. And so it needs to be wine. It needs to be bread. Does it have to be unleavened bread? doesn't have to be because the text doesn't demand unleavened bread. Typically, we use unleavened bread because Jesus did it on the Passover, and the Passover would have been unleavened bread, but the, word, the verb or the noun artos does not demand unleavened, so we would say any bread is acceptable, but it needs to be bread, and it needs to be wine, and those are the criteria. So we don't substitute grape juice for wine. And also the argument, which is kind of clear-cut, well, fruit of the vine could mean grape juice, no, it can't. Not in a March or April in Palestine. Because if you're drinking fruit of the vine in March or April, where did that fruit come from? Last fall. And if you're drinking it in the spring, guess what? It's fermented. There is no refrigeration. It's not fresh. There's no way it's not alcoholic. So it's wine. Wine is wine. Chris? What about non-alcoholic wine? Like people with who have... Yeah, so you, see, this start, you start getting into all these problems. Okay, what about, what about, what about? Um, so my, my practice would be to say, wine is wine, we don't substitute grape juice. Non-alcoholic wine typically actually has some alcohol in it, and which, is, which surprises people, because it actually is, you know, uh, there's a little bit of fermented in it, and if you read the label carefully, it'll say trace amounts, which is probably all right. My preferred practice actually is to do a dilution kind of a thing. So in other words, rather than give them grape juice, give them a little bit of water with a drop of wine in it. And if they say, oh, I can't have even a drop of wine, yes, you can. Um, the reality is, go talk to your medical doctor about this. And people who can't have any alcohol, talk to your doctor. Alcohol appears naturally in all kinds of stuff. We, we, got it, we get it all the time. So the amount of alcohol you would get in one drop is not going to mess you up. It's just not. And if people have this kind of psychological phobia, you talk them through it a little bit and help them with this. I've had people who are, you know, recovering alcoholics who are will never drink anything, but they take the Lord's Supper with wine all the time. Because for them, they see this as a sacramental gift, and they're not bothered by it. And so, uh, so it's how you approach it. Um, now, you get the other thing on the, with the whole bread thing, with you know, the problem today with celiacs or you know, gluten and common intolerance. And so <clears throat> gluten-free bread, you have to be careful with that. There are some gluten-free breads that are made, you know, not rice crackers. Rice crackers becomes a little bit problematic. But you can get gluten-free bread, which constitutes bread, and okay, we're all right there. But be careful about what you're using because, again, the point is assurance. And if people are, well, I got a rice cracker. Was that really Christ's body? I don't know. But if it's bread, but it's a special kind of host, okay. Brian. Like a, you, said, you said earlier, um, like a pr prison ministry or like a psych ward or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Cannibal ball in there. Right. So, I mean, uh, what if you gave them just, just the bread? Well, see, my practice would be to say probably we don't do the sacrament. Uh, I, I know, but right. I mean... And if somebody's desperate wanting this, so you would do, you do communion one kind, you might in your pastoral practice choose to do that. And this is where, this is because of this teaching called concomitance. 
which I wanted to talk about too before we leave this sec discussion. Concomitance means with, coming with. And so concomitance teaches, this is what Rome teaches, because they used to celebrate communion in one kind. You're familiar with that phrase, right? So communion in one kind means what? Bread. You only get the bread. And so in traditional Roman Catholicism, when the, you would go to get the sacrament, you would only get the host and not the wine. Now why? Well, it's very simple. If this is Christ's body and this is Christ's blood, if you drop the host on the ground, what are you dropping? You're dropping Jesus, you know? And that's why in high church Roman Catholics, when you receive the host, they would even have an altar boy coming along with a little dish and hold the dish underneath your chin to catch any crumbs that might fall. We don't want Christ to fall on the ground. Then those little crumbs would be knocked into the host, into the chalice afterwards and consumed, so nothing is left because they want to be very careful. Now, a host is one thing. What happens if a really clumsy layperson spills a little wine? You're dumping Christ's blood. That's a little harder to clean up, and we don't want to mess with this. So much safer, just give him the host, because concomitance says, if you're getting any human body, isn't there blood in it? Of course. So you got blood, you're cool. So, and this is what they came up with. So you get enough blood when you eat the bread, and we're, we're fine. So you don't need the cup. That was the argument. And now, Luther and the reformers said, wait a minute, Jesus said, take, eat, take, drink. This is for everybody, not just the priest. But traditional Catholicism had the idea that host can be for everybody, priest will do all the wine, thank you very much, and now we're all done. And that's how they did it. But the, one of the reformers' moves was to establish the sacrament in both kinds. And most Catholic churches today do it in both kinds, but not everywhere and not universally still. When I was in Honduras, I asked a couple of pastors, and there's only Catholic church, and then always really nilly. Pentecostals. Yeah. So I went to the Catholic Church and took communion every Sunday. And yep, only. Only, only the host. Only. Yeah, especially true in Latin America because they're far more traditional than they are here in this country. Yeah. Yeah. They're still, I mean, I guess it's, they're still very careful with the, the crumbs and stuff. Absolutely. Will, if you watch, they'll like dump it carefully. In Absolutely. The well, you, if, if it's transubstantiation, you're dealing with Christ's body and blood. Appropriate respect is in, is in place. And that, that I'm not going to argue with that. Okay, Kyle. So I agree with you, but if we're going into a, <clears throat> a context where um, maybe somebody's a, re a recovering alcoholic or uh -huh. something and has been taking um, one element for a long time, mm -hmm. how do you go about, do you even attempt to try to... Um, Bring them back to the full celebration? Yeah. The I think I would. Yeah. Or I think would, I would. And if they don't want to do that, would you... Um, try to talk them out of receiving the one element, or would you just leave it? No, I'd probably keep on giving the one element for a while, past, you know, my pastoral practice, but I'm going to encourage them to say, you know, Christ has promised to be here, and this is his gift, and how about we just, you know, I'll put, I'll dilute a drop of the sacramental wine into a little cup of water for you. How about that? And just check with your doctor, see if that's going to be a problem for you. And no doctor's going to say, oh, yeah, that's going to freak you out. It's not going to happen. Coleman. Um, and maybe we get to this intention and... Yeah, we'll get to that a little bit. Um, well, I'll hit it now, and then I can save my time later. Um, so intinction has become is popular in some circles, and I know some places in our synod apparently was quite popular and even encouraged. Um, and so the intinction, in case you're not familiar with this, is where you take the host and you dip it in the cup, and then you, you get you know a silk a soggy um, piece of bread, um, which can create problems if it crumbles fast. You got to move fast, <clears throat> otherwise it starts to collapse on you. Um, you have to get a good host. Uh, my biggest concern with this is, and this is, there have been whole studies done on this, and the Synod has like positions on it, but it says eat and drink, not dip and chew. And so my thing would say, intinction is not best practice. It's not my preferred practice. If you have somebody who is like deathly afraid of getting cooties from the, from the chalice, or they're afraid of giving germs in the chalice, um, and they just want to do that, all right, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to forbid it, I'm not going to discourage it necessarily, but I'm not going to teach it and encourage it either. And I'm certainly not going to have a practice where that's your only option. And I've seen that happen, which I find problematic. So um, I, that would be my approach. Um, and on the chalice thing, you know, we'll talk more about this too, but, you know, the, the chalice, people are worried about, oh, germs. Now spare me with that. Um, and that's where you need to actually educate your people on stuff. You get more germs shaking hands with somebody than you ever do sharing a cup with somebody. You just do. And the chalice has enough alcohol in it, enough precious metals in it, that the, the chances of a virus surviving on the rim of the chalice are not very high anyway. And they're going to get a lot more germs touching the bottom of the chalice or touching one of those individual cups that have been handled how many times than they are by taking the, cup, the common cup. So this needs to be some education there on this stuff. All right. So, yeah, Adam. Uh, 
Uh, can we at some point get too legalistic about the practice of communion and what we yeah. what we use and what we don't use? Well, I suppose you could. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my you know certain certain it has to be certain kinds of wine. It has to be you know that. Well, no, yeah, yeah. It has to be a fruit of the vine. It can be. It's it's wine. Does it have to be red or white? No. And if somebody, but see, if somebody says it has to be red, I'll use white, just to show you I don't have to be bound by your rules. But, and I've heard people say I like white wine because it doesn't look like blood. That way they don't think it's changing. But you know it doesn't really matter. It's and maybe we should actually you know pony up and get some decent tasting wine. I would like that because man, I've been I'm in too many churches where it's like ugh. What is this stuff? The St. Paul's in pair, they have like people donate their own wine. Oh, really? Because they own like wine. Oh, no, there you go. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's sad sometimes what we use, but I guess that's just conveying the, the most base elements can be the gift of God, which is very true. What about the common cup versus uh, individual cups? Yeah, I was going to maybe save that. Well, common cups versus individual cups. Um, there's, there's not a clear cut on this. Is it possible that at the Last Supper, all the disciples had their own little cups sitting in front of them at their place tables, and Jesus said, take, drink, this is my blood, so they all picked up their cup and drank? That's possible. It's possible. Yeah, little plastic shot glasses they could throw away. So that's possible. So I'm not going to deny that as a possibility. Now, however, the other side of it is the common cup does certainly convey a whole lot of pop, pop positive symbolism, that we're all sharing one cup together, and even the common loaf, kind of, there's a lot of power there, the unity, and this is kind of cool, and that's good stuff. The other side of it is, and here's my bigger issue, my biggest problem with individual cups is not even that we have individual cups, but it's the cheapness factor. It's the shot glass Jesus. It's the throwaway. What do we do with these, you know, ding, ding, ding. I hate that sound of these little plastic cups dropping in the bucket. Tunk, 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 you know? And it just cheapens the whole sacrament. It's just disgusting. And so that's my biggest problem. So, and I've heard of churches where they have little individual things, they're like little teeny little individual chalices, you know, and they're very fancy. But man, that's a, you talk about it, labor intensive, washing all those things every time. Um, but they'll do that. The better thing to me is just educate your people. And I, I don't have a problem with people having options, you know, having both things. But little plastic shot glasses just are really annoying to me and really offensive. It's just like, it just screams throw away Jesus to me. And if you're going to have individual cups, at least go with glass cups that you have to wash that are going to be a little more substantial. At least those are my thoughts on that. All right. Brad? I'll ask later. Okay. Oh, well, speaking of throw away Jesus, uh, maybe you'll get into this later, but the kneel at the altar versus the drive-by. Yeah, so that was not that big a deal. Um, Kneeling at the altar is, is cool because it, it heightens it, and, it, you know, and, and you want to do what you can to heighten it. But are you getting the sacrament? If you're standing and walking past, yes, you are. And is this truly the reception of Christ? Yes, it is. And can that be very meaningful? Sure. But kneeling is also good. And I don't like the idea of just kind of, you know, how do we speed this thing up? That can become a little bit of a distraction. Brian? I can't remember if people write to their sauce. So... Um, the, when, the, when the elements stop being Jesus' body and blood. That we'll talk about next time. All right. Page 356 is where he talks about concomitants. Okay, so we'll get, we covered that in case you're looking for it. And on page 357, which you didn't have to read, is footnote 101. And this is a long quote, but this is worth doing. This is just such classic vintage Luther. Um, and so Luther is concerned here about the issue of... Um, people who are doing some false teaching about this. Now we're on page 356. Luther properly castigates the absurdity of the concomitants in his well-known burning words. So he doesn't like this idea of concomitants, that, you know, you get the blood with the bread and so you don't, with the body, so you don't need to have both kinds. So here's Luther's quote on 101. The finest piece in the Bishop of Meisen's proclamation is that the Parsons are to teach, and this is the Bishop of Meisen's teaching concomitants, communion of one kind, are to teach the layman that in communion under one kind there is present the entire Jesus, the Son of God, God and man, also his body and blood, and is eaten and drunk by the lay communicants, even though they're only eating the host. So he goes on. This view is established by concomitants, that is, by inference. Since the body of Christ is not without blood, it follows that his blood is not without his soul. From this it follows that his soul is not without his deity. <clears throat> From this it follows that his deity is not without the Father and the Holy Ghost. 
Now Luther's starting to be a little bit, he's pushing his envelope, and it gets to be very comical. From this it follows that in the sacrament, even when administered in one kind, the soul of Christ is eaten and drunk, and the Holy Trinity with the body and blood of Christ. From this it follows that in every Mass, the priest offers up and sells the Holy Trinity. Now, since the deity is not without the creatures, it follows from the foregoing premises that heaven and earth are also present in the sacrament. From this it follows that the devil and hell are also in the sacrament. From this it follows that any person receiving communion, also under one kind, devours the Bishop of Mizen with his mandate and proclamation. From this it follows that every priest at Mizen in each Mass eats and drinks his Bishop twice under bread and wine. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. You just, you just got to love Luther. And so he's, he's just playing the scholastic game. You know, reasons, 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 off you go. And so this is just such great Luther. you got to love it. And so then he goes on, From this it follows that the Bishop of Mizen must have a larger body than heaven and earth, and who could enumerate all that follows? And so, and then, but lastly, this also follows, that all such drawers of inferences are asses, fools, blind, insane, and raving. This deduction is certain. Well, the devil has enjoined us to imagine such a concomitance. Who has ordered us to include more in the sacrament than the clearer words of Christ state? Who has made you sure that any of these inferences is true? How do you know what God can do? How can you know the measure of his wisdom and power that he cannot cause the presence of just his body and blood in the sacrament in such a manner that his soul and deity are not in the sacrament, though his soul and duty cannot be outside his body and blood? Who dare venture to discover and to perceive anything beyond what his words state in such miracles as his? This is Luther. The word is said it, we're done. <laughs> exactly. All right, good, and we got that. Um, so in other words, this is ruled out because it's, it's, again, we're saying things we're not sure about, just like we're ruling out transubstantiation. We're not sure about this. Now, the other thing that pops up is this word ubiquity. And this, we can hit this real quick, and we'll be good for the day. Ubiquity. Ubiquity, of course, in English simply means omnipresent all over the place. And often it's said that the reason Lutherans believe that Christ can be present in the Lord's Supper is because we believe in ubiquity. Because Christ's body is everywhere. And in, and in a sense it is. Christ fills all things. His human body is with him. It fills all things. But ubiquity is not why we believe Jesus is in the Lord's Supper. I don't believe Jesus is in the Lord's Supper because wherever Christ is, he's present with his whole body and soul. True, but that's not why he's present. Why is he present in the Lord's Supper? Because he promised it. And so ubiquity is irrelevant. To the Lord's Supper. It's true that Christ fills all things. Yeah, but that's not why he's present in the Lord's Supper. We go back to this again and again. Don't let anybody get you hoodwinked into getting hung up on ubiquity. That's not the point. The point is the promise of Christ. And that's why we trust that he is there. And that's why we are sure of it. All right. <clears throat> Good. So did the, sac did the Lord Reformed actually get the sacrament? We would say no. Because they're not receiving it according to God's plan, and they're receiving it only as bread, and so it's not really the body, and so therefore it's really not the sacrament at all. And that brings us to page 365, and that's a good place to stop, and we'll pick it up here and wrap it up, and we'll do some salsa next time as well.